Hi, welcome back to Parenting in the Trenches. We're doing a series on adoption, and today we are specifically focusing on transitions. That would include several kinds of transitions that you would find in the process of adoption, but also for different varying members of the adoptive constellation. So today I am welcoming my guest, Jeanette Yoff. She is a marriage and family therapist, child, adult, and family clinician. Jeanette has been in the field for over 20 years, and she's worked as a psychotherapist, supervisor, foster care social worker, and is the clinical director of Yoff Therapy, Inc. She, she also holds trainings for parents, social workers, and therapists on topics related to adoption and foster care challenges, parenting, the impact of pre-adoption trauma, grief and loss, open adoption, open foster care, attachment challenges, and she provides support to adult adoptees and foster youth searching for long lost family members. She also assists in reunion and family reunification. She is also the founder of Celia Center, a nonprofit organization supporting all members of the adoption constellation. What incredible work. It is complicated and she's here to talk to us a little bit about the transition piece of that work. Jeanette, welcome. We're talking about siblings. We're talking about transitions. We're talking about adoptive family experiences. I just want to welcome you to this conversation because you bring two very powerful lenses. One is the professional lens. You've done 20 years of this work. Also the personal lens because you're an adult adoptee. My support is more around um, adoptive parents trying to do the best job they can in preparing to fold a child into their family unit really well. And that immediate transition period feels really quite loaded. <laughs> like there, there's some awareness, never going to be enough because we're not living it in the same way. But adoptive parents are thinking so carefully through, I want this to be so positive, like as positive as possible mm -hmm. for the child that's coming to us. And mm -hmm. we don't really know what they need. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit to just that, the uniqueness of what helps a child feel that's such a scary transition period and so urgent and so big. Can you talk a bit about that? We all need to accept that adoption is formed through loss and that's grief yeah. and loss. So a child mm -hmm. will come with ambiguous loss if they don't know the prior history like myself as to what happened. So we need to acknowledge the mm -hmm. loss and grieving with your child is actually therapeutic and that's having empathy mm -hmm. for their experience and providing therapeutic parenting because you cannot parent a child who's been through adoption, that separation trauma, grief and loss from their families of origin and or a foster family or multiple foster families. They need a different parenting approach. But a lot of the ambiguity needs to be spoken to. Children need to know their stories. And a big piece of what causes trauma is the not knowing and not preparing a child for what's to happen. So in the transition, it takes a minimum of six months to two years to even bond with a child. Bonding mm -hmm. is crucial in attachment. So I want parents to think first about the bonding experience. You wanna fall in love with your child and get to yeah. know their nuances, their strengths and their vulnerabilities. I don't like the word issues or what's mm -hmm. wrong with them or pathologizing. Yeah. Every child is unique. They will come with their recipe of behaviors, their unmet mm -hmm. needs. And it's really being a sensory feeling detective with your child. And I tell parents a lot to do what's called mapping. When you see behavior, get a notebook, mm -hmm. make it a journal mm -hmm. and go who, what, when, where, and how when you see some big behaviors, because sometimes we don't even know what's happened to the child in their history, especially if it's an yeah. older child placed in a foster adoptive home. So you're doing a lot of detective work based on what you're seeing in their behavior. Mm -hmm. The presentation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of exploration, staying open-minded mm -hmm. to the experience of getting to know my child because they mm -hmm. are different than you. Now, 
I'm an adoptee mm-hmm. and I'm also a parent myself of a biological child. It was fascinating for me to learn, wow, he is really not me. He is very <laughs> He's different. his own person. <laughs> right. So you have yeah. your own yeah. filter and your child has their yeah. own filter. And a phrase yeah. I use a lot with parents and adoptees is their behavior is not a rejection of you. It is a reflection yes. of their unmet needs, experiences, their grief and loss. And children mm. don't know how to manage these intense feelings in the body and these intense thoughts that come out of, wait, what happened to me? How, how could any mother give away her baby? Adoptees blame yeah. her. We blame ourselves. There must have been yeah. something wrong with us until the day we meet other adoptees and go, or a therapist who's adoption competent. It's not about you. It was about the circumstances in your mother's life that she could not parent any baby born on your birthday. Parents do need education. And how do you tell your child their foster care and adoption story yes. so that they can make sense and have objectivity and go, oh, and understand the circumstances were in their mother's life Mm -hmm. and why a plan for adoption was made. I was just thinking back to when we adopted our first daughter and that the agency had given us a few concrete examples of transition objects, like bringing Mm -hmm. something that has a familiar scent with them, um, that their bedroom color is the same, that they're, you know, that they have choice and agency in choosing things as they transition, that you don't preset everything. This was not coming from an adoptee voice. This was coming from people, social workers who had been doing some of this work. And I, and I trust that they've listened to some input, but I was curious in meeting with you, if you had similar ideas or things that you could add to the, that pot of tools for, for parents who want at least to set the safest stage possible. Mm -hmm. Children do need familiarity, especially if you're adopting a child of a different race, culture, or ethnicity. You want to create an environment where they see themselves mirrored. If they're going to have siblings who don't look like them and are of a different race, culture, or ethnicity, we need mirroring. We need to know that there's other people who look like us. So even putting photographs or pictures of that child's Mm -hmm. cultural, racial, ethnic group in their room so that they feel a sense of, okay, this is home. This is something I'm familiar with. Something that happened for me is I had a little stuffed animal that I lost in transition and I cried and grieved. And it was this little cat because my foster father had given it to me. My parents knew that they needed to provide me with some significant object that was important to me. So listen to your child. I always like this acronym, be an owl, observe, watch, and listen, because they're always going to communicate an unmet need. And if the symptom comes up a lot of something that may have been lost, we're not going to replace it. We're going to create something to help the transition go smoother and with ease. So something that I use with kids Mm -hmm. is called a comfy doll. You can get these Mm -hmm. on a website called Grief Watch. They're filled with lavender and they represent the lost person that the child's grieving. Mm -hmm. Even if a child's parents may have died, we can now utilize the grief comfy doll as their lost mother or father previous to you. It's hard for parents to know that a child's grieving a loss to hold that grief with them and allow them to grieve by holding this. You can actually put it in the microwave and it can be, get warm. Uh, warm. Yeah. And they can hold on to it. So we're giving voice to the ambiguity. Really, really important. Mm. What's really important in transitions is if the prior foster family or if it's the birth family, can they provide information about the routine, mm. structure, what their room looked like there? That, yeah. that way you can bring it here. Something that was really important for me when I transitioned from foster care to adoption was when my parents put my name on the wall. In foster care, I kept writing my name with crayons on my bedroom floor and I got in trouble for it. And no one was understanding 
what I was communicating. I didn't feel yeah. stable. I knew that I was leaving. I didn't feel secure. I was trying to pen myself in their house because I love yeah. them. Love them. And so when I was adopted, they put my name on the wall and it was quite significant for me because it oh, meant stability. It. And then they even gave me a little butterfly necklace that said, stay, engraved inside of it. You're asking me to stay? <laughs> I'm asking you to stay. So it yeah. was this yeah. little, little significant that make I a big just, deal. Yeah. Names, yeah. um, including a child in the process of naming their, giving themselves a middle name. I didn't have a middle name. So we sat as a family and mm -hmm. said, what would you like your middle name to be? We talked about this together. We didn't change wow. my first yeah. name because I'm a big advocate. Please don't change names. If the child comes to you without a name, of course, you're going to give them a name. But that name has significance when their yeah. birth mother or birth father gave them that name. I know many adoptees who have grown up and have learned when they've obtained their original birth certificate that their names were changed. And guess what? They officially, legally go back and change their names to their birth names. Yeah. It yeah. is a reclamation. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's powerful. Really, really helpful. I do think a lot of what people read is theory-based mm -hmm. and they're confused they're left confused like yes. we understand that attunement is going to give you the best set of clues for what the needs are at any phase of development for your child what that looks like take people trying to put themselves in that in those in shoes and say but what would that mean for like they're anxious about this like i want to be actively helping what do i do if i see they're grieving and so just you pointing to tools and objects and the importance of that. I remember somebody talking with me about how they made a commitment to not anything, any object that came with the child would mm -hmm. never be used against them in any way. If something went wrong and um, they said, well, you know, you can't behave that way anymore. I'm going to have to take your blanket right? Because we know it has currency. It's tempting to use the currency to get behavior right. change and just saying how critical it is that we do not parent that way with children who have trauma in their past. This is not one, two, three magic parenting. It's mm -hmm. trauma-informed parenting. And we need to understand the significance that this doesn't change behavior. This causes dysregulation. And rupture between people, that's not yeah. going to be a bonding agent no. if you remove that, even temporarily. Those are sacred objects right. for a child. And just when you reflected some of that, I just imagined how vulnerable and how little someone might be able to claim as their transition object. And, and if that's ever used in a way that hurts them emotionally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that does not help them heal and it doesn't help you as a parent, doesn't create the change. Right. Anything yeah. that has yeah. significant attachment, it's connected yes. to the attachment to the prior family, yeah. should not be used as a consequence yeah. of behavior. I'm an attachment-focused therapist. And I have an attachment-focused parenting training for free on my YouTube channel. You must be attachment-focused and be trauma-informed. And we don't like to use this yeah. word because we don't want to think, oh, how could a baby be traumatized when they don't even remember? But we are understanding in research now yeah. that the body remembers. Yeah. Children, babies, infants, toddlers are having intense emotions in their bodies and they don't know how to self-regulate these intense emotions. Yeah. So what we want to go from is from consequences to boundaries. And when I said mm -hmm. therapeutic parent before, you want to provide daily activities that provide an opportunity for the child to emote. So one of my interventions, nice. I wrote a book yes. called Working with Traumatized Children and Families and Teens in Foster Care and Adoption. Amazing. There are DIY interventions. One of them is the anger bag. One of them is the sad bag. Mm -hmm. And these are coping skills bags that provide mm -hmm. containment 
and also opportunities for them to emote because they're coming to you with all of this. And I don't like this word, but it's baggage. They're coming to you with experiences of grief and loss collected and it's all in their bodies and they're having thoughts about it just because they're not actively talking about it does not mean they're not actively thinking about it. Trust me. Another tool that I have is the question box, which the child is allowed to ask any questions about their previous experiences or their birth family. Mm -hmm. And the parent one at a time answers them one week at a time, one month at a time when the child's ready for the answer. Again, providing containment structure. We acknowledge you had a prior life coming to us and we understand and have compassion for your grief and loss, because guess what? That is going to lessen the symptoms. They're going to feel yeah. heard, seen, and received. They need to process it. Yeah. yeah. The permission is such a strong message, right? When you when you go through those activities, I think it would be tempting to think the activity has the magic, but actually it's just a it's an avenue to what you're telling your child is that we are with you, and you don't need to keep that from us. We are here for you, right? Mm -hmm. We have space to hold that with you. You aren't responsible for holding that yourself. Let it flow, right? Basically, we're safe to let it flow here. Exactly. I did really want to talk about the sibling piece. You know, if you hunt hard enough, you will find resources on attachment. You will find resources on trauma-informed parenting. It's getting better out there, right? right? And people can access it a bit easier. What I hear the most from adoptive families is almost in aftermath, the recognition of the impact they did not predict on their children prior to adopting. So Mm -hmm. the sibling dynamic shifts. And I know a lot of agencies will prioritize uh, and in some cases say it's necessary. We won't place a child with you who is older than your bio children just for sequence sake. Knowing how to help siblings blend well, particularly for older children coming in. So older, I just mean not infant, but any, any child who has had a previous living experience with another family, the shift for them is so big and somewhat tumultuous that causes all sorts of things, right? So the adoptive parents have to be quite centered on that often. And they didn't realize what that would mean for ramping up concerns for their other children. They didn't think that part through, nor were they told to think that part through. So I'm hearing from adoptive parents coming in after, I need help with this because Mm -hmm. my eight and 10 year old who were so excited about this are angry. They don't want anything to do with our other child. We're like, how do we do this? This feels tricky. It will feel threatening unless deemed otherwise. Mm -hmm. We do need to sit with the children that are already in the home and have conversations about this. And let them know they're loved. You're not bringing in this new child as a replacement. They will need a lot of reassurance. Number one, they are loved. Also, we want them to be part of the process. Seeing a photo of the child. Getting to know who this child is. Getting to know their story as much as possible. Helping them form a connection. They can start being curious about who's coming into their home. Help them know what the process is going to look like. Is this in six months? Is this in nine months? This is the process. Help them know what the legal process is, like how this works so that they feel a sense of control in making Mm -hmm. this decision. Kids are smart. Kids want to know. Kids thrive knowing. It's what they don't know that scares them. So as much as you Mm -hmm. can tell them about the child and their history, also what I really like is before the child comes into the home, the parents can have a nonverbal signal so that Mm -hmm. if the child who's already been in the home feels overwhelmed about something that's happening, that they can have like a timeout signal and the parent knows it's time for me to meet their need. Because what happens is the adoptee is going to have so many needs and then the biological child or other sibling is going to Mm -hmm. feel abandoned in their own way because they have needs too. There's a tool from post-parenting called the 10-20-10. 
spend 10 minutes alone with them in the morning just to check in. How are you doing? Especially Mm -hmm. a few days before the child comes into their home Mm -hmm. and especially after. 10 minutes in the morning, check in alone, 20 minutes after school, and 10 minutes in the evening. They also need to have a lot of the same routine that you had prior. They need consistency Mm -hmm. and familiarity that things are going to remain the same. Sometimes there may be bumps in the road and you'll let them know there's realistic Mm -hmm. expectations. We may not get to the book reading every night at eight o'clock, but we'll do our best to do it between eight to nine o'clock. There's reasonable expectations, but their lives are still familiar and still in the same routine and structure. Really, really. A sense of reliability, right? Like I still can rely on you. And, and for kids that translates in things like routines, it's concrete. It's not just saying words. It's how do I experience you, right? If you're showing up at the same time in the same way, that consistency helps me believe that I matter to you still. Exactly. It's going to take time for us to bond. You can even tell kids psychologically, it yeah. takes take six months to two years just to bond. We're going to get to know each other. It's not going to happen overnight. When you were mentioning early, Jeanette, about the the give kids as much open, transparent information as possible. Yes. I know that that causes anxiety for some parents. Mm-hmm. Am I sharing too much? Is it you know, that that's one fear. And I also think that a lot of people's experience is that adopting from foster care in particular is really unpredictable. And so systems aren't doing a great job at providing the information that parents can use to mm-hmm. say what can be expected, how long something's going to take. It often gets bumped or changed in, in significant ways, not just a week, but like it's been put off for a year. And that just does such a number on humanity. You know, it doesn't matter where you are in this family system. Yes. It's hard to wrap our adjustment brains around, right? It's hard mm-hmm. to adjust to. When I have these conversations with parents, I'm often talking about the grief and loss of that, of what you had hoped for, what was told to you, what you had to adjust and change expectations around. Mm-hmm. And our kids augment that experience that that is harder for them because of where they're at developmentally we don't always get what we need to be able to do the thing that we know we need to do yes as parents foster Hard. parents yeah. the support you need during yeah. this process it will be a, a back and forth too of grief and loss and is this really going to happen yeah. the desire to be a parent is lost in the process because the system can get yep. in the way. I know it can take years yeah. sometimes yeah. just for parental rights to be terminated. It's challenging. And we're dealing with a child welfare system that is overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Not that that's an yep. excuse. We're dealing with a legal system that- It's real. It's yeah. real. What I tell parents is see this as an opportunity because just as much as you're having your grief and loss, the more you can mm-hmm. connect and- have a listening partner, someone you can grieve with, a therapist, that's going to help you be a better parent to the child who's also sitting in limbo. They're sitting in limbo too. I sat there for six and a half years. The stronger you get in understanding your grief and loss in this process, you'll be able to contain, join, attune with your child's grief and loss. So see it as an opportunity as opposed to let down. It's going to be hard. There's no question. It's a difficult process, especially come into the system wanting to adopt. Foster parenting is meant for reunification. It comes from unconscious parenting. Except you are a human being before you are a parent. And except you can't fix the pain in your child's story. You're only responsible for Mm. your own. That's well, Fred. Oh, that's so important. It's so important. It has to be complicated. I think it, there is no other way. There's, we're dealing with so many human beings with so many pieces that they bring with them Mm -hmm. and so much grief and so much loss and the transition journey can feel daunting. I think for everybody involved, like really overwhelming to grasp the way you said, please don't give up because it has been so important in your own life to have that sense of permanency. There are threads that keep us going through what seems like impossible 
mm-hmm. stages of a journey. And for us to know that our kids are also capable of getting through some incredibly overwhelming stages of transitions is is pretty powerful to realize, I think. They've got a lot of resources in them that we probably we don't see, but they're there. And it's hard to watch because kids seem vulnerable to us, and they are in a lot of ways. But mm-hmm. I think there's some stuff in there that is so resilient that we don't get maybe to see until later on mm-hmm. when some of the healing and the transition has kind of come through. Is there anything you want to add for an encouragement for adoptive parents in particular who might feel like this is really too much, really hard, or worried that they're not enough? You are enough. Mm. What I want to say is you do need to become foster care and adoption competent. Don't underestimate your learning. I recently published children's book, What is Adoption? Not only is this for the child, it's for the parent. I explain the process of why a child is placed in foster care adoption, all the different reasons. It helps give you the language. Included in that. And this has mental health interventions that explain to the child, Mm -hmm. you will be grieving and that's okay. You can create your question box. You can do all these things to help yourself with your feelings and your parents will be there to help you it's because you're going to be feeling your child's story and the pain. Yeah. And there is pain. That's right. And that's okay. Yeah. Because why do we become parents? We want to have yeah. connection. We want to make impact. Yes. We want to join. Yeah. So we have to soften is the word. Soften mm. the pain. The only way you can soften it is stop being scared of it. Yes, I was going to say the fear needs to go down. You've shared some amazing resources. Are there other resources in all the years of work you've done, some primary reading, some places people can go that might not be as well known that would be helpful? Attachment and Trauma Network is fantastic for families. Yes. Uh, North American Council on Adoptable Children. CeliaCenter.org. That's my nonprofit. We have Zoom support groups, the Michael Trout Institute, the Adoptive and Foster Mm -hmm. Family Coalition of New York. They have adoption competency conferences. The Center for Adoption Mm -hmm. Support and Education has an adoption competency free training for parents. The Post Institute. Mm -hmm. Jeanette, thank you so much. I, I don't have words to say how much I really appreciate you taking the time to do this, but just what you've shared has been incredible. Thank you. If you are a couple in a couple relationship and you are fostering or, uh, toward adoption, or if you are adopting through a private agency, um, we've created an online course uh, called Adoption, What to Do While You Wait. I created this as an adoptive parent and as a registered clinical counselor who supports adoptive families in the transition period and in preparation. Thanks for spending time with me today. You can also subscribe to my online learning page at my.thrive-life forward slash LRL series. Shoulder to shoulder with you, knee deep in this mud. I will see you back here next time.